Welcome to Fading Memories, a podcast with advice, wisdom, and hope from caregivers who have lived the experience and survived to tell the tale. Think of us as your caregiver best friend. Welcome back, listeners. I have an awesome story for you today. With me is Dave Iverson. He is the author of Winter Stars. He's also a documentary filmmaker, speaker, and I'm going to forget everything else because I'm not reading it. And we're going to actually talk a little bit about when it's okay to take a step back from caregiving. It's not something we've discussed in about 300 episodes. So thanks for joining me, Dave. Happy to. Glad to be here, Jennifer. Thanks for having me. So you're welcome. So you, in your book, talk about it being a six second decision to be to move back home with mom. You want to tell us a little bit about your background because you have a a unique extra challenge with caregiving that most of us thankfully do not have to deal with. Mm, sure, happy to. Well, my mom and I had always been close. Um, I was her middle son. She had three sons. Um, and we'd always had a, a special bond and a, and, a, and a closeness. And I'd actually moved back to the San Francisco Bay Area uh, a number of years uh, before this took place. I'd grown up in the Bay Area, spent a lot of my professional life in the Midwest, then moved back when I was around 50 years old. Um, and so I would come and see her on the weekend. I lived in San Francisco. She lived in uh, on the peninsula south of San Francisco in Menlo Park. Um, and and we just had a fun, good, close relationship. And she was indomitable. You know, she was this force of nature. She was always on the go. My dad had passed away many years before, and she had continued to live alone in her own home um, into her her 90s um, and did just fine. Um, and then she got pneumonia, uh, went downhill from that experience, tough hospitalization. And it just became clear that she needed needed help. And um, I'd arranged for some part-time help to be there when she was in the hospital, but it became clear soon that that would not be enough. And I just thought, well, you know, I'm working full time, but I have a lot of flexibility in my work. I host a, a radio show once a week. I make documentary films. I do other reporting, but I've got a lot of control over how I do things. I'll just move down and be with her. You know, my one daughter is grown and married and happily living her life. I can do this. And of course, I didn't have a clue as to what I was really in for. Um, and that in some ways, you know, I think that's a, that's that's actually useful, because if you really knew all that you were to experience, some of us might not have made that choice. And I'm, I'm glad that I did. Um, but it was challenging, hard, difficult, harder, probably than anything I had ever done. Um, and so, you know, it it was something that I learned immensely from, changed me, humbled me. But I also, Jennifer, didn't have any idea how just how hard it was, how angry I would get sometimes, how frustrated I'd get, how exhausted I'd get. And I had it about as good as any caregiver can have it, right? Because I mm -hmm. had help during the day. I had someone come in who was there. I'd leave the house at eight o'clock in the morning, not come back until 5.30 or six at night. As you well know, and our listeners know, that's not the norm. You know, most caregivers don't get to walk out the front door in the morning and not come back until nightfall. I did. My job was to be there through the night with her and on the weekend. But even that got to be really, really um, challenging. And I can I can talk more about how those challenges uh, developed over time. But um, I also want to say that it was as challenging as it was, it was also in so many ways, one of the most deeply rewarding experiences of my life. It taught me so much. It changed me, I, I'd like to think, at least in some fundamental ways. Um, and, and for that, I, I remain, you know, really, really grateful. The biggest thing, and I'll, I'll stop with this thought, was that I didn't have a clue when I moved in. She was 95. I was 59 that it would be a 10 year experience, that it would go on for a decade, that she would live to be 105. <laughs> and that's one of the things, of course, we never know with the caregiving experience. We, we It's not on a, a predictable clock. That is very true. When you moved in with your mom, and, then, and you didn't mention this in, the, in your 
that that little piece of storytelling. You have a family history of Parkinson's disease, and you yourself have Parkinson's. Did it ever cross your mind that moving in with her and caring for her might negatively affect your um, health? Yeah, well, great question. Um, yes, my father, my late father had Parkinson's uh, disease. Um, my late older brother also had Parkinson's. I was diagnosed with Parkinson's when I was 56. So I just had it a couple of years, two and a half years, I guess, before I made this decision. But Parkinson's is a very varied um, condition, as as uh, many of, of your listeners and you may know. Um, it exists on this broad continuum. And I had a much easier course and continue to. I'm still doing really, really well. Um, and so at the time, I felt like, you know, I'm really doing fine. I can, I can do this. Um, and I'm, I'm, I was lucky to, to have that, uh, uh, be true, but, you know, another aspect of this was that I learned my first lessons, I guess, of what it means to be a caregiver by seeing how my mom was with my dad. And it wasn't so much how she cared for my dad at the end of his life, which was tough, it was really how she lived with him. You know, she kept doing things. They kept staying in motion, which in Parkinson's is everything. Staying in motion is everything. And they did. They still went to lectures at Stanford where my dad had taught. They went to, more importantly, to basketball and football games because they were both maniacal fans. Um, <laughs> and, and, and so knowing that, remembering that, I think in some ways also contributed to my decision in that I felt in some ways like it was bringing my family story sort of full circle. You know, my mom had cared for my dad with Parkinson's. Now I had Parkinson's, but I could care for my mom. Um, and and um, I was lucky again because my own disease progression was so slow to be able to do that. But it actually made, I think, some emotional sense in that when you have any kind of challenging health condition, you still want to feel like you can do things, right? You still want mm -hmm. to feel like you can, that you, you can accomplish things. And I was accomplishing things in my professional life. But I think this, I know I felt pretty good about myself, to be honest, about being able to do this. And um, I think, so I, I, to me, at least, it all kind of made sense. I'm not sure that it ever doesn't make sense. Mm -hmm. My maternal grandmother had vascular dementia that overlapped with the beginning of my mom's Alzheimer's. So my mom was not, it was, she was about a good, as good a caregiver as I think I was. My, her father ended up with cancer. So she had to travel down to San Luis Obispo to take care of him. She'd be gone for, I think she was gone for a week. And then she'd come back. We had a business together, my parents and I, and she was gone for a week. So obviously was not a benefit to the business and that was fine. But when she came back, she was a wreck and she wasn't any good to anybody. And she really could not deal with her mother. And I think a lot of that was because she knew what was going on with herself. Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting because for a long time, I thought she was in denial and Having done this show for as many years as I've done, I realized that somewhere she shifted from actual denial about her disease to not knowing, which was interesting because I just assumed it was denial for mm -hmm. like a very long time. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, she she wasn't, I don't think she was quite the role model your mom was. So yeah. I, d I did the best I could. She was in memory care after my dad passed away. And I considered myself the captain of her care team. I was still in charge. I still had many, many responsibilities for her, with her, but I didn't have the 24 seven. I didn't even have it as difficult as you because I wasn't living with her because I knew that would never work. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, that's a, I think a really interesting point. And I don't know as we talk about this that much, one of the great advantages I had, not only in terms of my 
continued good health, not only because I had these wonderful women who came in during the day, um, but another great advantage I had is that my mom and I really did get along. That There were times when I would get really angry and frustrated, and I'm sure we're going to talk about that. But it was also, um, and that's not to be assumed, you know, I often say to people or to like, I gave a talk to uh, uh, the palliative care um, division at Stanford last week. And, you know, I said, don't assume as a palliative care specialist that necessarily the the caregiver and the person they're caring for are are always getting along because that's not always the case. It's hard. Um, and a really great gift that I was given was that in the main, my mom and I had a had a bond that held, even though it was sorely tested at times. We had that and we were compatible. You know, we had a lot of similar interests and, and that's a great advantage and not something I think you can necessarily assume. That is true. My mom and I were close, but not like you described with in your book. Um, you know, just a, she and my sister got along. My she and my sister were either best friends or mortal enemies because they were very similar, and that made that very difficult for my sister. And I know caregivers who are taking care of somebody they don't even like, which I don't understand how you do. One of these days, I'll have to interview yeah. the one that's coming to mind because. That's a huge sacrifice. Yeah, indeed. And, you know, make, definitely a better angel than myself because there were days, and like you said, you know, there were days it was tested. There were days my mom got, the more help she needed, the more confrontational she was. And she liked to scratch people. And she, she drew blood on the caregivers in the memory care. The one, the one that was mostly responsible for her got it two or three times and... It was awful because it was embarrassing. And it's like, that's not how my mom was, except that, you know, if you angered my mom, like when, you know, when we were teenagers and angering mom was almost a daily thing, you know, she was really good at holding a grudge. She made sure you knew how she felt about whatever you had done. And yeah. it was not easy to live with, but teenagers aren't easy to live with either. So, and, you know, I, I wouldn't tolerate her. If she tried to scratch me. I would just hold her wrists and tell her, no, we're not going to do that. And, you know, some people, they don't, they don't think that was the right move, but I wasn't going to let her abuse me. Yeah. And yeah. your mom didn't get quite that confrontational. Certainly not in a physical way. No, no, not, a, not at all. Not at all. She just got, I'm trying to remember, just, she got really cranky and got very kind of negative. And that, yeah, that, she, that was wearing. Yeah, she could be very critical, both of our caregivers and, and sometimes of, of me. Um, and I came to understand, but only over a great deal of time, um, that some of that, I think, was just her own frustration at no longer being able to be who she had always been, you know, that she'd always been this take charge person. She'd always been someone on the go, always active, always engaged with the community and with volunteer work and everything. Um, and I think it was deeply frustrating to her that she couldn't be that person. And it was, it must have been scary, you know, and, and like, what, what has happened that I can no longer be who I want to be? And she was aware of the big, you know, her own uh, dementia, too, and I, 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 early on. And so, you know, I have a much more sympathy now to her crankiness than I necessarily <laughs> did when I was at the receiving end of it, you know. Yeah, my mom had a, a, she would, she would mumble, grumble, kind of, I don't want to say complain, but just was a similar crankiness, like you describe, not necessarily directed at anybody in particular, just the general universe. And this was at the end of her life. And when I was a kid growing up, even as a younger adult, she would, she had this statement, drove me straight up the wall. She would say. You'd complain if you were hit with a new axe. Well, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> probably if I was still living. And there were days she would just, rah, 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 rah. and I'd be like, don't say it, don't say it. <laughs> and I never did, but it was like being in a ro role reversal. It's like, you know, I guess I must have muttered, grumbled, 
quasi complained about, I don't know, trivial stuff like she's doing now. And that's why she said this to me. And, you know, now I want to say it to her, but I know better because it's just going to make things worse. <laughs> it was that was really tough because there was just times it was just very hard to want to be with her. And that's kind of where, you know, it was about eight and a half years in. You were fine living with mom, handling all the caregivers and all of that management, which is a job unto itself. And there just came a day when you realized, I can't do this anymore. And I think a lot of us feel that way and either can't step away or are afraid to step away. Not stepping away as in like walking away and never going back, but stepping away from being the caregiver and going back to being the son, the daughter, the spouse. So can you tell us about that, that shift? Yeah, sure. I think the first thing I'd like to say, Jennifer, is that I had those moments early on, actually. I, I kept a, a, I kept a journal a lot of my adult life and I kept a journal during the time I was a caregiver it was actually surprising to me when I went back and started looking through it as I, I started working and writing this book at how frustrated I was and how ready to, to split I was early, early on. You know, I found I've, there are these entries a year or two into my caregiving experience where I, I would say, I this just is not sustainable. I'm going to have to figure out a way that by September, um, I'll I'll have other arrangements in place. And I didn't. Um, and, you know, then that moment would occur again. And I remember thinking, well, what's stopping me from making other arrangements and, and moving away or just being here a couple of days a week rather than every night? And it was this feeling like, well, I'm just, I wouldn't feel right about it. I wouldn't feel, wasn't so much, ob, it wasn't a sense of obligation so much as I just wouldn't feel um, that I was ready, that I wouldn't feel complete, that I'd feel kind of empty if I did that. And so I stayed. And that continued, as you say, for for eight and a half years and I think I wanted to make that point in part because I think it's really important to to know, you know, to to and and I think I was it was probably the right decision for me to stay through that, to kind of find my way through that. But there came a time uh, when I just was exhausted. And I remember the one evening in particular that prompted my decision was a night when I was making a fire in the fireplace for my mom, which is something she always loved. And she was sitting next to me and she kept saying that one of our caregivers had not taken her to church that day. And I knew that she had, and I'd say, well, mom, actually, you know, she, she did take you and she'd just repeat herself. And I'd say, well, she did take you. And this went on for a while. And finally, I just blew up and I turned around and yelled at her and said, she took you. You just don't remember in that kind of voice. And then I remember just sitting there and looking at the fire and thinking, who, who am I becoming? And I don't remember what kind of night I had that night, whether I stayed up, you know, and was upset or, or whether I just slept or, or what. But I remember over the coming days feeling with a clarity I had not felt before, I really do need to make a change. I really do need to make arrangements so that I'm only here a couple of nights a week. And I just knew it. I knew it with a kind of interior clarity that was different than what I had experienced before. And I knew that I not only had to say something, I wanted to say something. And I think that's important. Just as I think the decision to become a caregiver is much more sustainable if it's something you want to do as opposed to something you feel obligated to do. I think similarly, when it's time 
to say, I can't do this anymore. It's because you know that's what you want, as opposed to just feeling like, um, you know, I'm 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 no longer able to, or I, I can't stand this anymore. That's part of it too. But you know it's best if you make that choice. And I did know that. And I think it was also because I had these wonderful two women in particular who who had been with me for many years, um, who I knew could and and would step up and and help me figure this out. And they did. They made additional arrangements. They changed their schedules. They recruited, you know, one of them recruited one of their friends so that I could just be there a couple of nights a week. Um, and everything felt different then. I felt like I can now focus more on what needs to be done, figuring out our, our um, you know, th these arrangements, solving the problems we need to solve, uh, figuring out how we're going to continue to finance this, because by this point, it was really, really expensive. I had more energy to do all of that because I was now a son rather than a caregiver. I was, it allowed me to step to the side as opposed to stepping away. It wasn't like I said, see you later, I'm out of here. <laughs> I was, she would still be in so many ways the center of my life. But I was no longer primarily her caregiver, I was her son who made sure caregiving was in place. And that huge fundamental difference was freeing for me. Um, and again, and maybe I hope we can talk about this some, I was lucky that I could do that. Very lucky that I could do that because I had wonderful people and because my mom had a house that my folks had purchased in 1950 in Menlo Park, California for $15,000. And that by the 2007, when I moved in, it was worth a heck of a lot more money than that. And I could borrow against it constantly to pay for her care. That, that allowed me to make that choice too. Um, and when you think about it, what kind of caregiving system is that? that that you're fine and you can make these choices so long as your parents bought a home in, in the middle of Silicon Valley in 1950. <laughs> you know, that's not exactly a national caregiving plan. No, need, not at all. You need to do so much more than that. So I was fortunate in in really every every possible way. Definitely. And one of the things that because you only live about 30 miles Let's see, southwest ish, south of where I grew up, where I lived until 2021, end of 21. And the fundamental difference between where you were in the San Francisco Bay Area and where I was, there was a lot fewer um, women like you had. And I want to touch on that a little bit. Yeah. And when I haven't done this, this is going to be a, maybe a tiny bit of a risk, but. The women that took care of your mom were all immigrants mm -hmm. and they came with a cultural background that is different than a United States societal, um, the way we act, you know, thinking just our societies and our cultural beliefs are different. Doesn't make one better than the other, but it, it made them fundamentally better caregivers and maybe, maybe even if they were just family caregivers, but as paid caregivers. And I really wish more people understood that we have a global problem of aging, we have a global problem of climate change, and we need a fundamental shift in population. There's populations that are younger, but are in more threat because of climate change. And then we've got aging populations that don't have the younger people to take care of them. And we need... I've read and listened to podcasts where we need basically a transformative shift in where populations live. Mm -hmm. And we need a, a, a progressive idea of immigration 
or we're never going to solve this caregiving problem. We had a significant shortage before the pandemic, and that just made it 10 times worse. And, you know, people that live in, <clears throat> excuse me, more rural parts, further away from city centers. I mean, Menlo Park is the home of Facebook, in case anybody wasn't aware of that. <laughs> so that tells you where Dave's mom inhabited. I can I can picture the house in my head because that's a beautiful part of the Bay Area. <laughs> and, you know, what is your thoughts on how we solve this caregiving uh -huh. Yeah. Situation. Is yeah, it going to be really, immigration? I really am glad you raised these questions, Jennifer. Um, <laughs> a couple thoughts. I I do think that we don't, first of all, uh, honor and respect the work of professional caregivers enough in this country. Agreed. Um, the average wage, according to the Brookings Institution of Home Health Care Providers in 2019, was $12 an hour. Now, obviously, it's more than that in the San Francisco Bay Area, more than that in many urban areas around the country. But that gives you some framework for how this work is viewed. Um, and as Ajahn Pu, the head of the National Domestic Workers Alliance, has said, care is the work that all other work depends on. Because whether it's child care workers or elder care workers, many of us would not be able to work <laughs> if it weren't for those that, that care providers. And just as child care uh, workers are not paid well, so is it true for, for elder care. So that's, that's part of it. And I think so we need to honor that more. And part of the reason why I think we don't is at least in the Bay Area, that work is dominated by women of color. Um, mm -hmm. Every caregiver that I had um, was an immigrant American. Um, they were all women of color. Um, they were all women for whom English was a second, sometimes third language. All of them almost all of them work two jobs. You know, they'd be mm -hmm. with me and helping my mom and then they'd go somewhere else and spend the night taking care of someone else. And so I think that's, we have to change. Whether populations can change and shift and, and all of that, I, I'm not, I don't know. But I know we have to, that our country has to change in the way it respects and honors that work. And we have to understand that you know, when people say sometimes, well, the only people who should come to this country are people who are really highly skilled immigrants. That's who we need. Well, sure. But what skills are those? They're not just the technological skills that we so often prize. We also need the skills that caregivers have, kindness, compassion, the, the ability to, to take care of someone with tenderness and constancy, the ability to to change someone's diaper, the ability to, to cleanse someone's skin, to, to watch out for bed sores, to know how to pad the railings of a hospital bed so that someone's skin remains in, in, in shape. You know, those are incredibly valuable skills and we do not honor those enough. So it's something that I think is crucial to how we address um, this problem. And last, I also agree with you about how, you know, the, the women who were with me the longest, Sinai Latu and Eileen Khan were their names, grew up in cultures where family extended beyond your nuclear family, where caring for the old was part of life's bargain. It's what you did. And and I think we have a whole lot, <laughs> of those of us who grew up in, in a different culture, to, to learn from that. Um, and those bonds, Jennifer, that I was fortunate enough to experience, they did as much for me as they did for my mom, you know. And we're still, I talked to Eileen yesterday, you know, we had a long talk on the phone. We remain in close contact and it's been five years since my mom passed away. I am so grateful to have been enriched and continue to be enriched by those relationships. And that's something I hope, I wish 
we can all take to heart and and learn and progress from as communities and as a society. I fully agree. As I mentioned, my mom was in a memory care community and most of her, well, most of the caregivers on staff there also did two jobs. And I don't know how they managed because some of them worked at Starbucks for eight hours and then came right. to memory care for eight hours. And that's hard enough, but right. you know, Starbucks isn't easy and dealing with people with dementia isn't easy. It's just exhausting. And you almost have to be concerned that you know, because they're so underpaid and undervalued that they, they burn out quicker. And then now we've got other people who need care. And now we've lost, you know, it's just, it, to me, it's almost like a snowball effect. And you, you had, I have a point to your comment, how we said, you know, we kind of prize um, immigrants with high tech skills, you know, like, and I can't remember exactly how to pronounce the name, but the founder of Google is an immigrant. And, you know, Hey, yeah. So it's like, hello, yeah, let's have more of them. But we still need the caregivers so those people can do what they can do. Can you imagine if, you know, the founder of Google or some other, you know, up and coming company was also a caregiver trying to do, trying to get this new idea off the ground while also trying to maintain a family member? We That's where we lose because people, you know, it's like a brain drain. And I don't think people understand that. And until they do, we're going to continue to have this problem. Now we're going to take a quick break for an ad. These ads help me continue to bring the show to you for free. When I learned that despite eating as healthy as possible, we can still have undernourished brains, I was frustrated. I also live in a farming community, so I'm aware that our food isn't grown as well as we need. Learning about NeuroReserves, Relevate, and how it's formulated to fix this problem convinced me to give them a try. Now I know many of you are skeptical, as was I. However, I know it's working because of one simple change. My sweet tooth is gone. I didn't expect that, and it's not something other users have commented on, but here's some truth. My brain always wanted something sweet. Now fruit usually did the trick, but not always. One bad night's sleep would fire up my sugar cravings so much they were almost impossible to ignore. You ever have your brain screaming for a donut? Well, for me, those days are gone. It's been about six months since I started taking the supplement and I have no regrets. I believe in my results so much that I'm passing on my 15% discount to you. Try it for two or three months and see if you have a miraculous sweet tooth cure or maybe just better focus and clarity. It's definitely worth a try. Now back to our conversation. Yeah, and I think it's up to all of us who are caregivers. You're going to Washington soon to to lobby on behalf of the the Alzheimer's Association. I think it's those of us who have the opportunity to talk about this, to to advocate. It's it's part of the responsibility I, I think I think we have because we can make change you know it's it's hard it's tough it's arduous but it's possible for us to change and we're going to have to because you know my favorite demographic statistic is that someone turns 65 in this country every eight seconds Oof. every eight seconds so think about that that means that as of this time tomorrow at whatever it is 8 45 in the morning tomorrow wednesday march the 1st there will be eleven thousand more 65 year olds living in this country than there are right now so you know it is in all of our interests to wake up and contend with this because we are approaching a, a, a real crisis in how we care for our oldest citizens. Um, and and uh, it's just something we must we must face. I completely agree. So circling back a little bit to our main topic, you wanted to walk away many times but didn't. Um, maybe it just... Dis- Decision by inertia. You didn't make the plans so that you could step away, as you mentioned. How how would you advise somebody who 
keeps thinking, I can't do this. I need, you know, I, I need to step away. I need to do something different. How would you advise them to process those feelings? Like most, I think a lot of people feel that way, squash them down and just keep going because unfortunately, as we've been discussing, there are not very many viable opportunities yeah. to make changes, especially if you don't have the means. But even if you do, if you're not in urban areas with, you know, women like you had, like I said, I was not that much further away from you and our options were more limited just because we were in the suburbs. How would you, how would you advise somebody to kind of process those feelings to determine whether they should stay, if that's okay for them, or if they should, if they should just become the person's care manager and, and put other caregiving in place? Yeah, it's such an important and good question because there are so many levels to it, starting with whether or not it's even possible. I mean, for me, I again, I had this, I had the advantage that it was possible for me. Setting aside that really important question for a moment, I think that it's really important to just think it through, feel it through in a way, because it is about feelings as much as intellectual, you know, argument. Um, what is it that I really feel here? What is it that I really want? What What's going to be best for me? What's going to be best for the person I'm caring for? And then see where that turns out. For a long time, for me, it was, no, I'm really not ready to, to, to leave this yet. I have more... Maybe in part, Jennifer was even feeling like there's more I have to experience. There's more I have to learn. There's more. I, maybe there's more ways in which I need to change. <laughs> but really think that, feel that through. It was helpful to me to have people I could talk to. You know, I could I could talk to the woman who would become my wife. At that point, we were we were not married. I could talk to my daughter. I could talk to a very close friend of mine who was going through something similar, whose husband had Alzheimer's and we were old, old friends and we could just talk. And it's so helpful to have someone who knows what you're experiencing, really knows it, you know, cause you can start, it's like you can start in the middle of the story. You don't have to start with the table of contents. You know, you can just, they get it. They're already on page 175. They're right there with you. That, I think is is really, really helpful. Perhaps, and I didn't avail myself of this to get professional guidance, to be to think about seeing a, a, a therapist or a counselor of some kind to help you work through this, to help you feel like you're not necessarily alone. That's one of the strange things about caregiving. It is such a common experience, right? According to AARP, there are 54 million family caregivers in the United States, mostly caring for older, older people. And yet we all feel, what do we feel? We feel most of the time like we're all alone. There's no one else experiencing this. And yet there is. So I think you have to break through that. And, and then sometimes maybe it's being creative. It's thinking of ways you can do this. Maybe if you have siblings, you can draw upon them more. It's not easy, but I think you are so much better off if you can at least start that process of finding and feeling your way through this rather than saying, I can't feel that way. I, I just can't. I can't. I don't think in the end that's going to serve, serve you or the person you're caring for best. And last, I would say that I realized in the end that I didn't have to be a hero. I didn't have to be there until the very, very last moment because I had wonderful people who could who could be there. I didn't, I was stepping away, still there a couple of nights a week and making sure that my mom had truly wonderful, extraordinary care. I didn't have to feel like, like the savior, you know, and sometimes caregivers can have a bit of that sense. Like they're the only people who can possibly do this. So it's worth asking that hard question too. I was blessed. My dad was in the hospital the end of 2016 for 32 days, which meant my mom was at my home. 
my sister's home, and then her younger sister would be with her in her home. So she got bounced around, which is definitely not ideal, with her dog that my dogs hated. And it was very obvious. I was 50 at the time. I just turned 50. And my husband and I are both self-employed. My business was attached to our home. There was no way. I'm like, I know, man, because my dad, right before he passed away, his best friend looked at me and said, well, now your dad just assumed your mom would come live with you. Talk about a cold bucket of water. It was like, uh, yeah, thanks for that conversation, dad. <clears throat> but I knew that was not a sustainable path. Yeah. yeah. Um, I mean, I didn't know what I would do with her dog, my dog that would wrap himself around my office chair, 85 pound golden retriever. That was always fun. He was literally my shadow. Hated her dog so much that he would go sleep in the yard, which was not him at all. And I just didn't, I didn't have the ability to have the patience. It's like, okay, we need to do this, 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 because clients are coming later and I need, you know, it was just like, here's my to-do list and here's where you fit in and, pfft, yeah. you know, which we know does not work. <laughs> so thankfully we rented out my mom's home and that covered most of the yeah. care fee and yeah. social security. And they had some investments. So the financial planner put money in her bank account and the trust account to cover it. She had plenty of money. I always worried about her money because being in a memory care residence, I saw residents getting to the very most difficult stages and their families ran out of money. And then what do you do? Which, you know, that's a whole other conversation is to, my, my husband and I were just talking about it. He's a real estate broker. So of course <laughs> we've talked about your mom's house in Menlo Park, but we talked about the property that you know, was where my mom lived and how much it cost and how much the taxes are and how much we think they may have brought in. And, you know, I don't know how to change that fee structure. So it's, so the right. caregivers get paid a respectable wage and the, you know, the families are not paying seven, $8,000 a month. Cause that none of that's sustainable. That's a whole other podcast episode. <laughs> but I, I think, a really important point you've made, Jennifer, is that, and I've always, I always, I don't want to ever come across like this is something everyone should do because it's not, you know, it was something that I actually wanted to do. It wasn't like I felt like I should or was obligated. I felt like I, I wanted to. And I was in a unique circumstance. It was, it happened at the right point in my life. If, if, this had, if my mom had no longer been able to live independently, if that moment had occurred 10 years earlier, I, I wouldn't have done it. If it had occurred 10 years later, I wouldn't have done it. It just happened to be at. And so that's a really important point to address, because while I'm glad I had the opportunity and I, I'm so glad my mom had great care um, from people who are around me and, and hopefully from me as well. Um, it's not what's best in every circumstance. It's not what's possible in every circumstance. You know, the, the subtitle, my book is called Winter Stars, which is a, uh, I can explain why, but, but what I, what the point I want to make is actually the stuff, the subtitle, the subtitle is an elderly mother, an aging son in life's final journey, because it's, it is, a, it is a, it is a journey and one that is a shared journey and how we negotiate that journey and what choices we make that will help that journey be, be loving, you know, be loving and, 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 and caring can be answered in many, many ways. You know, living with the person you're caring for is one way to do that, but it is not the only way and it is not always possible. What we have to focus on is how can we make sure that this older person we care about, be it a, a spouse or a sibling or or um, a, a parent, receives kind, compassionate, loving care so that they go through the last part of their life feeling accompanied, you know, feeling that they're not alone. And how we do that, I think, is the second question. And we have a long ways to accomplish that. But no one should feel like they must do this. I think that's the fundamental shift we need to make. It just seems 
there's a lot of expectation. Oh, your mom's got Alzheimer's or your spouse has Parkinson's. Well, of course you're going to take care of them. I mean, it's almost like there is no other alternative, even though there are, not necessarily better or worse, but it just, from my experience, that's the expectation. Moving mom to memory care was, I want to say people acted like it was a cop-out because most people didn't. But I don't think because my mom was in a, a care residence, people understood the burden. And that's kind of a tough word that it still took on. You know, there was sure. still a toll that it took on me. Sure. My mom was always in the background of everything I did. It didn't yeah. matter if I was photographing a family or create Well, the podcast started because of her. So that's kind of not not accurate, but I always felt like her needs and her life were took precedent. She had Alzheimer's and I didn't. So if I had to drop what I was doing and rush her to the doctor because the doctor wanted to see her for some random reason, you know, I, that's where I dealt with that a lot. The doctor's like, what do you mean you can't, br you know, just drop everything and bring your mom in today? It's like, mm -hmm. um, I have clients this afternoon. And then they would act like, you work? It was just the most bizarre thing. But I kind of feel like society also kind of, it was like, I still did all of my stuff. I ran my business. I was in the Rotary Club. I went cycling with a cycling group. So on the outside, I looked like my life hadn't changed a lot. But internally, it was always like, you know, is mom okay? Am I going to have to like zip home on my bike because the care home called and there was an emergency? It was just, it seemed like there was always this background noise of her. And then COVID hit. I didn't see her the last two weeks of her life. And then, then it was over. And it was like very abrupt. It's like, oh, now I don't have to worry about all that. And I was grateful for it because, you know, she died March 31st, 2020. So yeah. obviously the entire globe was in an upheaval. And I just kind of kept going forward with you know i didn't have anything else to do so i kept doing the podcast and you know we we didn't have the typical rituals like we had after my dad died so you know it's i think people need to understand what what it takes out of those of us that do the caregiving whether it's like you who move in with mom or you're you're taking care of a spouse or people like me whose loved one was in memory care you know it's it's a weight you drag around for a long time. And that's kind of why I wanted to, you know, touch on and talk a little bit about when is it okay to say, I have to, I have to take a step to the side because, yeah. you know, I felt like I was always one foot in quicksand. You know, like mom's life was going to drag me, drag me down, drag me into the doctors, drag me into the hospitals. You know, it was always her, she was always first no matter what I was doing, which is surprised. I think. A lot of people would be surprised to hear that, knowing she was in the memory care. She didn't always have to be first, but she was. And I don't. Yeah. yeah. Well, I used to say it was my mom was sort of like the fulcrum upon which my life tipped back and forth, you know. And um, it's yeah, it it you might have your list of things to do for the day. But if something goes awry with your care arrangements or or with your mom, then every everything else falls to the side. You know, people like to say, well, you can't care for someone else unless you, you know, take care of yourself. That's just happens to not be true at all. I mean, caregivers take care of someone else rather than themselves all the time. It comes mm -hmm. with the territory. You have to find your way through that and find a way to still care for yourself. But it's not easy. It's not just, oh, yeah, you have to take care of yourself before you can care for someone else. That's just not the case. And caregivers neglect themselves every day uh, because they don't feel they have choices. Um, and I think it's also really important to remember, you and I have been talking about the challenges of caring for a parent, but I've always felt that that has to be easier than caring for a spouse. Everything, I think that has to be more intense at, in, in some levels. And you must feel even more constrained in the choices you can make when it's your spouse as opposed to when it's your parent. There's a little bit more distance when it's your parent. 
So I think that's worth remembering too, that everyone, every caregiving situation is different and every relationship is different. So the challenges, you know, we have to, we have to be respectful of those, those differences too. Well, I think when you're taking care of a spouse, you're of similar age and you might have your, like my dad had, um, he was diabetic and he wasn't real good at taking care of his diabetes and it caused other health issues. And I, I firmly believe that he got so thoroughly worn out. Um, he had a donated kidney that was losing functionality because he didn't take very good care of it. And I think he just got so worn out. He gave up. Yeah. Um, and that bothers me because he didn't allow my sister and I to help. He, you know, and he didn't, he didn't have the understanding that a lot of us do. He read some of the books, but like he read the 36 hour day, which I find immensely depressing and not necessarily beneficial. And the podcast started just for your knowledge, because I was reading books and doing research and trying to find ways to engage with my mom in a more, um, in a better way. She liked to ask me, what have you been up to lately? Every two minutes till I wanted to smash my head into the wall. And I'm like, I can't do this. And I'm like, there's got to be a better way. And I couldn't find it. So I just started a podcast and <laughs> started talking to people who had been there and done that. And that um, I'm still learning from wonderful people like yourself. So I'm confident that my audience is also learning, which is, you know, gratifying in, in itself because this is mostly a passion project. But yeah, it's I, I can't imagine having to take care of somebody that's maybe your age, the same age when, you know, you're aging. It's like, you know, you right. should be able to slow down, not work 10 times harder at the end of life. And, you know, and it's it's difficult. It's just we really need a fundamental shift in how we think about caregiving, how we um, finance it. It's just it's a big challenge, <laughs> but I'm up for it. Because my paternal grandmother lived to be 103. So that's my goal. I have 47 more years. <laughs> <laughs> One of yeah, these days, well, I'm going to have to make sure I do the math right when it changes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, and and I sometimes joke to my, my uh, daughter, who's now in her mid-40s, that you know, my generation of the aging baby boomers are sort of this country's worst nightmare because there's so many of us and and um, we're going to be around a long time. So it's not only um, in society's interest, it's in our self-interest to to try to work on this problem and, and improve the care options um, for 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 everyone. Yeah, you guys did make a pretty fundamental shift in our society from birth on. So Feel free to keep making fundamental things <laughs> for the better, okay? <laughs> for for us Gen Xers who are behind you going, oh my God, I don't know what we're going to do. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. I, I worry that at least the millennials are bigger than my generation. So there's a little hope that maybe it'll be a little bit better just because there's more of them than there are of us. So, right. but yeah, we still need, we still need a lot of changes and I hope conversations like this help people you know, reframe some of their thinking. Maybe it uh, it will validate the thought that, no, I can't do this anymore. And now you're not a horrible person if if that's the choice you have to make. Or if you, you know, like Dave did early on, you know, he, what, you weren't ready to step to the side and be the captain of the team. So, which is actually a really good analogy considering what sports fans your mom was. <laughs> <laughs> she was indeed. I was expecting to read that you took her to the Giants games, not to the baseball games at Stanford. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, she was a Stanford fan through and through. Well, I'm sure the intimacy of college baseball is was probably better as she aged than going to a giant stadium like whatever they call the giant stadium in San Francisco these days. It's right. had many names since it was built. Right. Is there any no. is there any Which last oh, go ahead. No, no, she was just, she was, it, it, it was a sense of community for her. You know, she, she loved being part of that, loved throwing out the first pitch when she was 94 years old. You know, she, 
she relished those those moments um, and uh, and and loved Stanford sports with a passion that was um, it was great. It's actually a great, great. I use that now as my rationalization for still being a fan and, and going to games that it's good for you. So I can see that. So is there any last bit of advice you would like to leave the listeners with before I let you start your day? Because it is really early for those of us in California. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I guess I would just say that it's worth considering what you want to have happen in your own life so that you're not leaving your own children, if if you're of an age like mine, uh, you know, in the dark about this, to talk about this, to talk about care arrangements. Um, and if you're in a situation where you might be called upon to become a caregiver, to, to consider that those options carefully, to think about them in advance. Because mostly we tend not to think about this. We think, oh, yeah, well, my, maybe my mom's going to need care. Oh, but what am I going to make for dinner? You know, you just, <laughs> you, just, you just don't go there. My suggestion would be to go there, you know, to, to think about it and to consider it, to consider the challenges, but also consider the ways in which it can be life changing um, for me, at least in very positive ways from ways that I think I became a, a kinder human being to also the ways in which you are enriched by the kind of discoveries and relationships you have in my case with with um women caregivers uh, who i i learned so much from so be open to those possibilities despite the challenges um because there is great great awareness um great understanding um that can come from that as well as the opportunity to be with someone you love until until you as long as as you can that's beautiful advice I appreciate it. Everybody should get Winter Stars and read it. I literally read it in three sittings, which tells you a lot about the storytelling in this book. And I appreciate your, your coming and chatting on a slightly tougher topic than I generally hit on. You did it really well. Thank you so much, Dave. Thank you, Jennifer. And thank you for all the work um, that you're doing to expand the conversation we all need to have. Welcome. Fading Memories is also available wherever you get your podcasts.